Okay. A lot of what? A lot of food in front of me. I just came with a bag. Oh, it's a weird angle, isn't it? Okay, leave at the camera because otherwise they might think that we're dead. Um, not everyone is actually in. Does anyone mind? Well, yeah, that is what it is. If you really want to be in the shot, you can move down. It's a bit weird talking to the camera when it's so far away. They're definitely not going to be able to see the screen. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, can you hear us? Um, so thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being with us while we get good at the technology. Um, we wanted to do this session like as when we came up with the idea of the group because there is no kind of explanation of what kind of digital technology is. And that was one of the biggest, um, we did a Predi, Menti, Menti, thank you. Um, in our first session, and one of the biggest questions that we got was, what should I be reading if I want to hear in the digital ethnography? And while Zoe and I spoke to digital ethnography in different ways, with fabric, <laughs> um, neither of us are kind of experts, and I've taken the digital anthropology course at UCL, but I, it, it's, that was a long time ago, and it certainly wasn't holistic. Um, so we thought something we can all do as a collective and something we can kind of give back and, and keep as a, an online collective resource is this reading list. But we wanted to also <coughs> make it into a kind of collective meeting today so that we can all kind of talk about what texts are important to us for people to ask questions and we can kind of bounce off of each other about things that we thought were most interesting. And as you can see on the list, we've organised it a bit into kind of thematic analysis and ethics resources method and then classical. Um, digital ethnography, and um, maybe we could have a section for kind of new and upcoming work or like emerging sub subfields. Um, so it's kind of quite organic how we've done it, but it's been really nice to see how people have engaged with it. Um, so maybe we can kind of start by going around the room and explaining why we're here and talking a little bit about your work and maybe get a sense of how to go from there. Yeah, and people on the live stream, please can you type your name and where you're from and why you're here? Thank you. And, and people in the room, you should have in front of you the reading list, which I just tweeted, if you have, has everyone got it up on their screen? Mm -hmm. And um, you can also load the live stream, just turn off the sound, if you want to chat to people as well. And you can see, because I'm going to try and incorporate their stuff into what we're talking about, but it's easier if you can also read what they're saying. Because there are now 16 people. Up where? Well, yeah. You could. You could, yeah. Just the just the chat bit on the side, just with the reading list on the also on the screen. Yeah. Okay. The link is if you type in my name. There it is. Second one down. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Whoever has the live stream. Okay. Yeah, yeah, turn off the sound. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I'm trying to figure out if everyone can hear us and stuff. I have had people say hi, but tell me on the on the chat if if you can hear us okay. You should change to live chat. Hello. Hello. Please join us. Maybe just here? Yeah. <laughs> Brown, you should change the live chat to the top. Oh yes, good shout. I should do an ethnography on YouTube. Maybe oh, okay, good, good. Um, great, so, so we, so yeah, so oh. as we said, we start by going around the room and maybe talking a little bit about what brought you here today and into your research, where you are in your research as well. Yeah, yeah. shall I start? Yes. Okay, I'm um, sorry for people who have met me before because I feel like that's a bit repetitive. Um, I'm Zoe, me and Bramwin are the founders of this collective. Um, I am researching YouTubers and the online video industry, um, and I do both online and offline ethnography. So I have quite a lot of interest in literature that tells me how to bridge the gap between online and offline. Um, I also do also ethnography in the form of becoming a YouTuber myself. And um, so anything about also ethnography is also useful for me 
and I've added quite a lot of that stuff to here, but I hope that other people will have some sources that I can filch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Rinsler, and I'm a first year PhD candidate at the Department of Media Communication from IFD. And I'm working on a project which is uh, looking into the uh, early adopter community of the virtual reality technology. So it's uh, kind of related to this idea of digital ethnography, but um, I don't really know like how to approach this project. So mm -hmm. basically, today I'm here just to learn from you guys. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about using ethnography, yeah. but you're not sure yet. Um, I'm Jennifer. I'm Jennifer, <laughs> and um, uh, I'm actually based in uh, Hamburg, in Germany, and um, I'm here because. I have two months in London and I thought I'd pop by to learn something not only via the live stream, but um, being physically here and saying hi to all of you. And uh, my research is on some anthropologists, that's my background. And my research is on how young people use digital media for their memory making processes, but not only on social media, but also how they incorporate phones, other things that they might not share. How do they decide what they share, what they don't share to keep their memories? So I think there's like different modalities of memory in that sense, what they want to do. And um, in my second year, and I'm also trying to incorporate like participatory methods. So I'm actually doing a digital storytelling workshop at the moment in a school in Stratford. And um, yeah, this is interesting, <laughs> but it's also not as participatory as I would hope it would be because I'm basically the teacher to them. <laughs> and um, Oh, yeah, this is another story, but this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I know someone you should talk to. Taylor Annabelle? Yeah. I'm just <laughs> talking with her. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. She often comes to the meetings. But yeah, she said she was very sorry that she can't be there. Yeah. So she thought it sounded really interesting. Yeah. Oh, well, she might be online. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's weird that you guys can read it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm Carwin. I'm a. I'm finishing, I've handed in a draft of my thesis, my, which is nice. My, my research is about migrant workers in Beijing and also about on digitally centered activism to protect migrant worker rights amid evictions in Beijing. So I cross over between traditional field work and digital field work. I guess my issue that I'm having is I think I'm, I am doing ethnography. That's clearly part of everything I do. Although in the writing of my ethnography, it often looks like I'm just talking about what I'm clicking on, which is a bit banal and boring. It doesn't right. have the flair of uh, traditional Big ethnographic work. Yeah, mm -hmm. so anyway. Um, hello, I don't think I'm on the screen, but hello. Um, <laughs> I'm, you can uh, turn it if you want. To. No, 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 that's fine. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, I'm Claire. I'm a PhD student at King's, um, just over the road. I work on um, digital activism, well, activism and then looking at the digital aspect of it, um, specifically looking at the feminist movement in India. Um, and I'm going into the work in a couple of months. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of similar in that I'm looking at like the intersections between the online and the offline. Um, so yeah, I'm How using, long are you going into field work? Uh, probably about six months. Um, so yeah, visa dependent. So awaiting the outcome of my visa. <laughs> what department are you in? I'm in the political economy department oh, cool. at King's. Yeah. Cool. Hi. Um, hello. <laughs> um, I'm not a PhD candidate. I do not have a PhD. However, I've spent the last 30 years writing about computers, freedom, and privacy. And so when I saw your thing announcing this on Twitter, I was curious to see what you guys were doing mm -hmm. and whether my knowledge of internet history might actually be a help to some of you. Mm -hmm. um, What's your name? My name is Wendy Grossman. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Wendy G on Twitter. And uh, you mentioned doing a study of YouTube. I don't know if you know, there's a guy named Chris Stokel Walker who wrote an entire yes. book about YouTube. He's my good friend. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I reviewed his book for ZDNet. I was in the book. Oh, yeah. even better. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So, I mean, I first got online in 1991. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've 
been through several cycles of mm. rising and falling social media. Uh, so I don't think that counts as ethnography, but I've observed for a long time. But I think this is a really important point that was made actually by Nancy Bain on Twitter, which about this was, was that quite often when people are thinking about work now, they forget all of the work that's been done historically in this area. And, and I would be definitely benefit from having some that's really kind recommendations. Of, that's kind of what I was hoping I could Absolutely. offer you. Yeah. Um, for example, the first book I'm aware of, the first study I'm aware of that was written about uh, flaming and abuse online was in 1988 wow. by Sarah Kiesler, who is now a professor emerita, uh, I think somewhere in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So mm. I have the book. <laughs> Wonderful. So, so um, I was hoping I could be useful okay. and also actually learn some interesting new things. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Hello. Um, Anyway, <laughs> you can put your face in front of it as well if you want to. Yeah. Upside down, yeah, yeah. upside down makes it really cool. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm just postgraduate from Garrett Smith and in the culture department, and I'm currently and doing my master's degree um, of uh, contemporary art theory. So I'm more like uh, engaged with the theory instead of just like the practical field work. So I just want to learn more from you as a workshop, being engaged in the workshop, mm -hmm. and. What well, I'm currently uh, collaborating is um, I, I collaborate with an artist um, from China and um, who has um, doing some program about the network culture, network society, especially um, some cyber nationalism in East Asia area. So we are all focusing on uh, the issues in East Asia area. So uh, we also would like to um, bridge the gap between the East and the West. And when, when Western countries are always stress they are in a kind of a digital democracy, but we are actually in an, another side. So that's what we are engaged with. And so we'd like to have a communication. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Ville, and I'm also a PhD here in, student here at LSE Media Communications. And my research is about this about communities online and more about digital objects and I'm studying how charities and data scientists are using data sets to address social good questions and I'm working with like London-based charities and facilitators and how they are using data and I'm interested in the data part of this as a digital objects. What I wish to find here is that have discussions of where is the kind of place of the objects in the digital ecography and see what comes out. Cool. It'd be good if you have any references to share on that front, because I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure if other people will will know. <laughs> there might be some stuff on the list already. Are, are hackers not no longer kind of. Central? Yeah, it's hackers. I also earlier like was working with civic hackers, and they are one of the groups that have been driving the change in London. Mm. There's a significant overlap between the kind of groups who drive the change and who adopted the change and civic hackers where one group were changing it but they are less prominent maybe in mm -hmm. the people who actually work with the charities at the moment. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, hello, hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Gaia Casagrande. I'm a, a PhD student of my third year, actually in Rome, La Sapienza, but I'm visiting here in King's College, Digital Humanities Department. So I'm basically, in, in my thesis is about uh, um, um, immaterial labor on social media and uh, um, you know, the analysis of uh, uh, self-branding practices. <coughs> so, uh, I've done this uh, through interviews and structured interviews, so I'm not dealing with ethnography at the moment, but I'm here to learn and also maybe in the future I would like to use ethnography instead of uh, uh, some structure mm. or as well as well, yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah develop maybe more the ethnographic. Yeah, hi, my name is Aditya. Uh, Aditya Ray. I'm, I'm a geographer uh, by training and uh, I'm a postdoc at the Open University. And I'll also be uh, sort of doing master's uh, dissertation supervision at Sheffield. At digital culture program. So I am, my work is basically uh, based on uh, digital outsourcing workers in India. 
uh, but also I'm trying to like expand it beyond uh, to other sort of global margins uh, mm -hmm. beyond just uh, India. So looking at uh, the working lives of people who are involved in digital arts also. Uh, so questions of scaling, training. Uh, I've done ethnographic work with uh, with the communities who work so called at the bottom of the uh, sort of value chains, uh, the services value chains. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so basically, digital labor, but I'm also more and more interested now in looking at media cultures, looking at lives of uh, all kinds of ways in which people express themselves uh, online, uh, not just the ideas of uh, uh, digital as, as, as a skill, but also as performed uh, by young people who work in these new sort of uh, contexts. So I, I'm an urban digital sort of infrastructure somewhere between mm -hmm. uh, kind of a uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Hi, uh, my name is Raquel. I just finished my uh, PhD, which was a uh, online and offline ethnography of the music practices of Spanish migrants in London. Um, and I look at uh, music online as material culture and also uh, music practices the relationship of the music practices online and offline. Um, yeah, and I had a bit of ethnography and I had interviews and I had a, a survey and a mixed method. So yeah. Cool. Um, Would you introduce yourself? No, no, go ahead. I'm Sam and I'm in the anthropology department here at LSD. Um, Currently in the last stages of my PhD, mm -hmm. I'm not strictly a digital ethnographer. I work on infrastructure in the Middle East, um, but I, while I was doing my fieldwork there, I started to look at um, the communications history of Palestine and how people use social media for their sensibility. Um, so I looked specifically at um, Facebook and WhatsApp practices among um, settling and refugee communities, um, and I also worked a little bit on online dating and Tinder as Lovely. Now, I don't know, have you been reading the comments? It's always tricky to know how to incorporate, like, to make it into one thing without just reading out a lot of comments. <laughs> yeah, it's mostly names, and you can please do join the chat as well, because it's just nice to the try chat. and, like... Oh, I see the chat on YouTube. Yes, so, so if you... Do you follow us, follow us on Twitter, yeah? No, I don't think I do. I just... For some reason, so saw your up. randomly saw your message. Well, if you want to follow, in fact, you might as well anyway, because we have, I've just tweeted the link to this live stream and also okay. the, the link to the reading list itself, which is a shared Google Doc. So okay, what, what's your ID? It's at digethnoglse. Okay. Um, so it's good if you can pull up the reading list anyway. And um, do you have yourself a tweet? Yeah, yeah, help. Get going. please do. Um, yeah. Um, so maybe where should we start? We perhaps it would be wise to start with kind of classic text. Maybe. Yeah, maybe move that over there so we can still see the chat on the other side. Oh, why did we pop out? We saw the chat on the on the. Yeah. I said you always put screen up. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh, struggle. It's like magic. Okay, I asked people why they wanted to join the live stream, as you can probably see down the side there. I mean, there's 26 people in the chat, so there's actually quite a lot. And maybe I don't want to read them all out. Um, but Davina, I just saw your question. Is it okay to share about the workshop on social media? Yes, please do. Share the live stream link and whatever you want. If you can hear me, I think they can hear us. <laughs> so it's gonna be fine. Okay, cool. Um, Why don't you start, and I'll just read through some of the things just to make sure that I'm not picking up. Um, I mean, certainly one of the reasons we wanted to do this session is because we're both interested in what text people found really useful or meaningful, or things that kind of they read that got them into doing digital ethnography. So I don't know if anyone has any strong opinions um, about. Kind of really like core, not necessarily traditional, but like texts that they read that made them think, I want to do something like that. 
Oh, wow, you've got, well, just nice to see familiar titles in them. Well, you would hope so, I guess. <laughs> That's kind of the thing. It's like, I, I think the, the point is that we, whilst it seems that there are a lot of people who are interested in digital ethnography, especially from the amount of people who have joined, I mean, there are 600 people on our mailing list, so I guess there are lots of people who are interested in it. But it's not, there aren't that many courses that teach digital ethnography or digital anthropology. I mean, you did the course at UCL, yeah. so maybe maybe you brought some of that into this list. Well, we probably both did to yeah. a certain extent. Um, but that's a very that's one small corner, I guess, of digital ethnographic methods, um, and it's a very particular style, which is more sort of traditional anthropology, like going to a place and doing the offline kind of online fieldwork thing. Um, but other than that, we couldn't find any resources that really offered any reading lists. Mm. Um, and so we thought, well, if we have 600 people on a mailing list, all of whom seem to be interested in digital technology, then presumably they're all doing work in this area, but none of them necessarily have access to a reading list. Mm. So we thought, well, let's just make a reading list. But the thing is, we, we started the list. We probably had about five pages worth that we resourced between us. But now it's 12 pages long. So there's a lot of stuff on there that we haven't read, right. we're not familiar with. We don't know. Did anyone here add anything to this? I think most stuff on the online, to be honest. I've only added one text, which is, um, I was just recently reading, um, it's from, I can't pronounce anything, Pluto, I think. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and it's called Digitalizing Digital Ethnography through immersive computation, becoming observing participant in a blended digital landscape. Wow. So it's very long um, <laughs> title of the um, piece itself. It's not that long. It's just a few interesting ideas. I think that you can pick out, there's nothing groundbreaking, I would say, but I thought it might be helping someone because it's kind of dealing with the problem of if you do online ethnography, I mean, as you said, like it just feels like clicking. Sometimes you don't really feel like you know you are the ethnographer, or whatever. Right. So it's kind of um, dealing with this: how can you immerse yourself more into the field, right, through the screen? And it has some ideas and points. Mm. Yeah, that's something I've been thinking about quite a lot because the reason why I decided to make videos as part of my research was because, well, partly because I'm researching the practices of YouTubers, so obviously to to understand that you know, to really be a participant observer, I have to be a YouTuber. But apart from that, it's like, it just feels like very easy to kind of look at stuff, like to crawl through stuff, but not to participate in any way yeah, online. And I think, uh, there, I don't, I can't think of that many readings that really help with that in the social media context, mm -hmm. which is like obviously specific and recent, but like, I think Christine Hines book, what's it called? Internet, the internet, it's on there. Mm -hmm. uh, I added all of these, but this one, uh ethnography on the internet oh that article ethnography on the internet taking account of emerging technological landscapes is really useful mm. and it's really short it's like yeah 14 pages long i, I use it though but also her book <coughs> ethnography on the internet for me that was the one that was like actually helping me think about the, the relationship between online and offline and participating in online communities and stuff like that because it's specifically about the internet and not just about technology in a broad sense, mm. which, which to me is very useful. Um, yeah, and I think yeah. that work fits quite nicely with some of the other work about uh, this is more, perhaps more specific than technology, but this kind of collapsed yeah. thing is the one that you can kind of activate in the as well. So those two are very much the same. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. actually a big shift from the beginning of. The, the really early work because, you know, in 1988 or 1991, you had to dial up to get to the internet. So mm -hmm. it, the reason everybody talked about it as cyberspace was it actually did feel like you were going to a separate space, mm -hmm. particularly since you often didn't know anybody in real life who actually used it. <laughs> yeah. So um, so that, that's, that's been a big shift in the last uh, 10, 15 years as mobile has taken over the, right. and broadband, the feeling of being continuously just part of your life yeah maybe it may be like in relation to that is also that 
we now have like phenomena which are just like native internet phenomena and you can research them as something which originates from the internet of course it might have multiple locations but instead of it being something that you immerse yourself in the real world and then discover the digital aspect to it you can actually start the research from the online phenomenon itself on its own merits we, we had internet phenomena um, if you look up the phone booth in the Mojave Desert or hamster yes, dance, there are, you know, there were, there were, this. even in the beginning, there were strange things online that yes, didn't exist. Yes, there have been always things, but now there's more of them, I would say. Well, there's more people too. For me, I, where, I just, my main contestation is even having to discuss digital in this process. I guess, I don't know, Madiono and Madiano and Miller's work mm -hmm. talking about transnational migration was one of the first things. Media. Yeah, and that for me, that got me thinking more about it in terms of what I could do as a researcher. And in that, I guess then the digital is not really the main thing there. It's an ethnography of communication mothering transnationalism yeah. which is has bits which are on facebook or skype and it has bits which are in houses in london or the philippines and and then looking at the connections between places mm -hmm. um so for me that was the main thing but then i guess the pink et al book digital ethnography practice and print principles and practice they have their um five or six or seven key principles mm -hmm. and one of them being it's offline as well it's mm -hmm. against the digital centricness yeah and i think that's something that's happened hasn't it over time like like you were saying you know when you think about bell store obviously that was the argument for like or boninardi mm -hmm. that you can just look at an online space and as a world mm -hmm. and now and everyone then disagrees with that you yeah. know and that's kind of been the trajectory hasn't it Oh, talk louder. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I guess yeah. I just wonder where your, when the digital ethnography collective and the digital ethnography list is just a list of every ethnography which is done post 2018, 19, 20. I think it, you'd have to be doing a very specific and different type of ethnography well, now. A very specific type of ethnography now to not include a digital component of it. Yeah, that's probably true. So, yeah. how will you, how do you think the list, should, this sort of list, should deal with the fact that most ethnography, most ethnographers will probably be including something about this now? I had this with a couple of months mm. ago um, with the Oxford group. Mm. You know them. Yeah. Um, actually, I think you spoke there, didn't you? Yeah. I didn't go to that. Um, but uh, um, so it's this, but in Oxford. Um, about, um, yeah, exactly that. And somebody said that digital ethnography was specifically ethnography of the digital rather than just digitally like enabled ethnography. And that's mm -hmm. what the difference is. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's something that you all. Hmm that's the definition that you would use or not, I don't know. I kind of thought that was kind of a useful way of, but then yeah. I am I am looking at the digital specifically, so that works for me. That's, yeah. a, that's a good point because there's, a, if you think about ethnography that has a digital aspect to it and yeah. ethnography of the digital in some like uh, more fundamental level, yeah. they might be quite different things. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. But from my point of view, when you look at music practices, there may be no difference between what is a practice that you do through the screen or through a keyboard uh, and, and a practice that we think of we don't use through a screen, but we still do. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if you think about the music practice in concert, you still um, perceive that through a screen mm -hmm. at the live concert, mm -hmm. and you still use your own screen to like, record this. And then if we think of music online, obviously we think about with your laptop and your phone and you listen to country music um, when you are out and about and, and you log into things and you go to YouTube. And, but all of those are just 
sides of the same coin. They are not separate. So I have, I find it really hard to do this distinction between. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a similar thing. The digital or an ethnography that includes digital practices. I think it's kind of yeah. um, the same. Yeah. You want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I just like to add on to that because I think there's an interesting point of like departure for both people who do work only on digital versus people who think about the digital in its social and real sort of uh, mediations that, that, that take place. Um, I think uh, one important thing that I feel as because if it, we're talking about digital photography is to where are we grounding some of this stuff vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the larger sort of disciplines and epistemologies? And what is the real departure point? So for example, for me, classical texts, cultural studies texts, uh, media and culture people know this better, and humanities people know this better in terms of looking at readership, authorship, questions of reproducibility, <coughs> questions of uh, multiple uh, so realities and single narrative and stuff like that. Those are, I think, interesting for even in context of like those are some some those are kind of like epistemological sort of uh, meta epistemological uh, things that we all deal with, regardless of whether we are talking about the online world or the offline world. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, and essentially, I, I my my first master's was in, in humanities and. I remember in 2008, I was looking at questions of uh, multiple <coughs> endings and informatics and how they can uh, you know, change storytelling practices. I was looking at the media uh, uh, in Germany, actually. <coughs> so, I mean, for me, some of these, and we were referring to some of the texts that were written in the 1930s, even Benjamin and all of those texts mm -hmm. and cultural studies and critique of culture and representation and distribution. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, some of those classical sort of dialogues were also very important to have when we are talking about the now of what digital is. And so how, so my point is like, how are we, it is important to ground some of that, even if it is only about the, uh, the digital, how are we grounding it? And we all come from different backgrounds, have different trainings. So the question really in, in that sense becomes how, how are we grounding the ideas about what we think is digital and how we are actually uh, approaching it. So I don't know, I mean, it's an open-ended comment in that mm -hmm. sense. Uh, so it is partly about the analytical uh, object of our study or the subject of our study, but it's also partly to do with the idea of how we ground our research. Uh, and rather than being very sort of uh, exclusive I think in this group we can be inclusive in terms yeah. of how we approach this. Yeah, I think I think like between me and Branwyn, for example, we decided to start this group because we both felt the need for more collective, um, I don't know, pooling of resources or knowledge. I guess when it came to digital ethnographic research, but we have very different types of research, and that's why when we we started the group, we kind of framed it as like you could be interested in dig the digital in terms of like online culture and social media and platforms and all that kind of stuff because that's where I'm coming from but also how the digital is impacting on in other contexts offline context infrastructurally and I think that is an extremely broad um broad church and I think you're right Carwin that like Technically, anything could be included, and I'm sure that as time, this is why it's useful to have a group like this, or for us, we believe that it's useful to have a group now, because a lot of people are coming to this thing, because anyone in sociology, anthropology, media, and photography, you know, all of them, whatever, any kind of social sciences or humanities type of subject, is going to be dealing with the digital in one way or another. And if they're interested in ethnographic methods, then they need to be interacting with these sorts of texts where they're trying to think about how do we how do we bring together the online and the offline and media in our ethnographic work Which makes, sorry, i was just wondering it makes me wonder if it might be interesting to organize this list chronologically in to yeah. just to throw awareness to the fact that there were things happening in the late 80s well I, I thought 80s. i would just start a historical section 
Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah, <clears throat> but I'll do it. I'll do it at home where I've got the bookcase yeah. handy. Yeah. For example, there were a number of early online services, things like the Well, which still exists, and Kix, which still exists, and Echo, which does not still exist, <clears throat> whose um, creators wrote books about them and study. You know, it, m partly personal memoir, um, but also you know probably quite valuable, useful stuff. Some of it. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we should have, because we one of our questions was going to be, how should we divide down this, this list? And like we started with, I don't know whether, oh, can we go up to the top? Because Carwin added a nice uh, contents. But um, started with some, uh, and then other people added other ones. Mm. So um, I don't know if this is a useful way to divide it down. And obviously a lot of the readings can sit in multiple categories. So that's the trouble. But I, can't, I definitely think we should have a historical section. And I also think it, maybe it'd be fun to have like, Maybe at the end, this, all of the readings were in chronological order. Yeah, it doesn't really matter if they're repeated if in one document. If you did it right as a sort of um, relational database, then people could sort it any way they wanted. Yeah. If you, yeah, you could make it public as a tarot or something like that, or Excel. Yeah. Yeah. If it were a spreadsheet, then you have the year of publication. And, sure. You know, you separate yeah. it into fields, and people could sort it. Yeah. One of the things I'd say about those early books is they were kind of written for people who were never going to go online. I think I, I always thought of them as sort of travel, like the travel section in newspaper typically is read by people who don't travel a lot, you know. So I always felt it was partly explaining this weird new thing. But also there was kind of a presumption at the time that it was a minority interest because it was. Yeah, and that is a major, major difference in what we're seeing now versus mm -hmm. what we saw back then. That kind of the idea that it was a sub sub community. Well, the early online services, the first thing you put in your online resume, which there was every service always had something where you could post a little profile of yourself. I mean, basic, by the way, I mean, every social medium now copies all of the social media of, of the past, and they, they just look different, but the functionalities are pretty much the same. So you always had. Uh, you always had a little online profile. And the first thing everybody always put in their profile was what kind of computer they used <laughs> because that was the one thing you knew everybody had in common was you all had a computer and you probably were the only person in your family who knew how it worked. <laughs> Divina. Yeah, do you wanna, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with this chat, but it's kind of tricky. We can see interesting things. A question. Global North feel like they can be used by our theoretical framework, but sometimes it seems like a forced explanation. How do we navigate this epidemic knowledge connection? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, like I said, I, I believe in, uh, I think my, my whole point was actually that uh, we have to base the discussion on something. And if your own experience of doing research or practicing research and of your own education sort of tells you that you are navigating a field which is lopsided and you don't have to sort of necessarily pay reverence to existing canons of knowledge and how do you base your findings and analysis. You don't have to do that, I agree. But at the same time, somewhere I think it is about basic questions about what what are you going? What are you actually saying when you're making these claims in your study through your findings? So, for example, if you're doing a research in the global south, uh, what is the intention behind it? What 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 communities you're uh, you're researching, and to what end are you uh, sort of? What what's your purpose with it? I mean, so 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 the the answer is always going to be in that sense, uh, mediated by your uh, sort of worldview and your own, I think, in that sense. So they can, there is no sort of, there's no forced requirement to engage not in that sense. It, it can, it is in that sense, a hege hegemon of itself, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's how you decide who you're going to be studying it. And it's a very important question. How do we make sense of who the, where the power structures are, whether we are looking at those things when we are doing our, whether we're doing online ethnographies or digital ethnographies, or we're, we're doing any kind of study. So for me, the answer, the, 
there is no one answer, but there's like, it's always about what actually we are talking about here, and what are our uh, underpinnings for, for why we are doing this kind of research. Maybe that's like a very good point of also structuring it, that like if we think about the, the foundation, what do we want to engage with, because you will end up doing a very different kind of uh, like a ethnography if you want to engage with like quite perennial theoretical questions and how they are being reframed or how they are changing in the modern world in comparison to wanting to document some new phenomenon and understanding the logic of like how do people act online in some specific community and even if they were looking at the same topic it would be a very different study in there and maybe those books that we've been listing there and the pieces the articles maybe they also engage with you and contribute to different bodies to knowledge in this way absolutely mm -hmm. I also have a question that I, I'm just curious about um, and when I just look at the reading list I find there are so many specific topics and for example uh, there are some books related to India or Caribbean or some you know too specific and so in regard to your uh, conversation that you uh, said you want to make a connection between the F1 and online and between the uh, virtual rules maybe a virtual cyberspace and the uh, materials, for example, uh, the digital devices that we use and the database, uh, maybe located in the Los Angeles and so on, so, so on and so forth. So um, i just curious uh, about, uh, I mean, um, if we can add some books like uh, the stack of uh, written by Breton, I think all of you know Breton. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's more, more like uh, he tries to, uh, uh, I mean, he tries to construct, uh, kind of construct a kind of uh, holistic theory um, in regarding to the digital, the society, anthropology, and uh, um, maybe the urban space, the art, and it's just like uh, the contemporary philosophy. Uh, I mean, maybe we can just uh, engage more with the uh, holistic theory and make a connection um just like a, a kind of guideline and uh, for example uh, the breton and also have you ever know the windy chun mm. <laughs> i'm sorry so. yeah she's uh, she's a she's a professor uh in toronto mm -hmm. and uh, yeah north american and she uh, what she's currently doing now is and uh, doing research about the digital surveillance and about political economics in north america so maybe we can because, um, for example, there is LSD, so maybe we can just try to uh, use the perspective of the political economic and also the philosophy and, and bring those perspectives into the anthropology and into digital anthropology instead of um, just talking about um, maybe to uh, talking about the you know, society or mm. uh, the personal habit because we can engage with more. Mm. And well, might so yeah, maybe so. like new themes. Like you were talking about how to organize it, maybe like maybe intersections in the, the way and like theory of the internet. Yeah. Well. Uh, I yes. do political theory, so I want political yeah, yes. theory. <laughs> Um, like, I once went to a yeah. virtual worlds conference with a bunch of lawyers who wanted to wanted all the virtual worlds to set up town councils and discuss laws. <laughs> I thought normal people don't want to do this. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying you're not normal. I'm just saying it was just it's just interesting how people look at the space and say, oh, I want to create this, which is actually you know sort of their image of. Yeah, the, but that's the thing, isn't it? I think this is that's why this is interesting because, you know. You're in anthropology, and I come from an anthropology background. So we're very much, that's like our grounding mm -hmm. um, as academics or researchers. And I think that that is specifically the whole point is that you, you study a specific context, and yes. that is what you're doing. You're studying the culture. But of course, topics such as surveillance or whatever, you know, all sorts of topics can come through that ethnography. It's not that you're just talking about. The practices and nothing beyond that it's always connected in some way to theory otherwise it's like what's i was modern, what's i was going to say but, you know who really studies certain online communities is security researchers because they they, they study the hacker forums quite closely mm -hmm. so. yeah i mean one of the things that's been really interesting about the work in an anthropology department oh sorry because i sit in an anthropology department where i'm the only person doing digital anthropology um, and notably no one from my department comes to these meetings mm. 
um, it's been really nice to see that ethnography is increasingly becoming, you know, not the domain of anthropologists, right. it's becoming a, a method that, that every um, social science and beyond that even are kind of having a go at and are bringing their own um, expertise. So this has been really nice in this reading that um, it's really reflective of that. Mm. Of not that many of the resources on there are specific to anthropology. Anthropology tends to be quite slow as well because we do longer research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So everything yeah. we write is five years late to the game, whereas other people are able to be quicker. Right. And of course, in the digital field, being five years late is really right. Um, <laughs> and anthropology has been very resistant to yeah, digital, yeah. Yeah, or digital media, anything. Media. Yeah, media. Yeah. Particularly your well, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, that's kind of a two-way issue. Like one of the problems with cybersecurity is that it's only recently that it's starting to embrace other disciplines besides, you know, and there is actually a research institute at UCL that has been in the forefront of working with social sciences and psychology and all sorts of, because because cybersecurity is a really complex problem it isn't enough to say well this is how you can use your computer you actually have to you actually have to have all these other sort of much more mm -hmm. human sciences to make it work i have a question yeah. which is also i don't know i hope a suggestion for for the discussion but is a topic that i don't know so it's also a question for you what about and um, and it, this question right uh well, well sorry for my english <laughs> uh yeah it came in mind uh, because uh, you have cited uh, so that you have talked about cyber security and what about uh bio hacking bio hacking yeah. so the hacking and the certification of the body but also in medical and doctoral practices mm -hmm. it's quite an interesting topic quite new and i think that for this kind of method, anthropology, but also ethnography could be like a really rich field, mm -hmm. also in collaboration with maybe, because I'm not a doctor, of course, and, mm -hmm. but maybe with the other colleagues of other disciplines like psychology, or I don't know, because they are doing this DNA hacking. Well, somebody some, somebody really should study the quantified self movement. There's been several studies. Yeah, oh, no, it's yeah, fascinating. It's no, it's I'm kind book. of studying that myself, in with slightly not in terms of biomedical stuff, although someone in Svetlana in our department does mm -hmm. that. Um, but in terms of YouTube creators, I look at the like quant quantification of labor and race. Yeah, and doing the same thing with another target uh, with on the self branding practices. But what about what was thinking was more related to the biopolitics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. yes there is this book of uh, Deborah Black looked on which is quite famous uh -huh. the quantified yeah. self but mm -hmm. also in this I was thinking about that uh, thinking about the methods mm -hmm. because uh, uh, how can you right. yeah uh, investigate the body of one right. another mm -hmm. one of the other right yeah yeah, this also it's... also links to what I was saying at first at like the role of digital objects. Yeah, because maybe. if we mm -hmm. think about social questions and that's something that might or might not be online, mm -hmm. but we have digital objects that are very yeah. close mm -hmm. to what we are doing right here and they yeah. affect our everyday. Is that digital ethnography? Is it something else? Yeah. How should that relationship be explicated? Can't really say, but like there is definitely some differences in how people who talk about the ethnography of objects and multi the ethnography of following objects and looking at the relationship between people and computers, for example, is a different thing than what people who talk about online communities are talking about. Yeah, that's true. You probably you'd probably find a lot of stuff in um, what do you call it? There's like a whole. I mean, in anthropology, there's yes. a whole sub discipline of materials. Culture. Well, the UCL's digital anthropology is quite an inflicted side of material and culture. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that's really and so they're very interested in that kind of thing. Although, maybe not so much from like an STS. I don't know how much they're in that STS world. No. Um, but I'm sure it would be useful. It's very different. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It, it, it just reminds me of that I uh, recently participated in two programs, and the one is um, held by the Huawei, um, Huawei University. And that we was, and they have a department in interdisciplinary department. So, and they uh, 
the title of the program is People Like You. And they just try to, um, they just um, try to um, propose that the people um, online is more like, um, there are have a similar, they uh, have a similar portraits. They have a similar, like, uh, the, the, the expression or, or something. And just like um, to explore the biopolitics and also the, uh, the identity online. So I, I think it's quite in link to what you, have discussed, uh, have discussed, and also there is another program that talked about the, uh, yeah, it's in the network society in China that I've engaged with, and so it's all, uh, also about the, uh, how the Chinese uh, people feel like, and um, I mean, how, how they construct their kind of identity, because, you know, the ideology is quite different from there, and so, so there is more about the biopolitics that the um, digital media and technology can be used by the capitalism and also by the nationalism. And uh, so, so that people is like being controlled uh, in such a kind of surroundings. Uh, I just, I'm sorry, I just remind you. Yeah. Cool. Um, I guess we're not doing very well at sticking to the, the categories we laid out, but this is quite nice as well. Well, I think <laughs> it's good to think beyond the categories. Yeah. Uh, it's useful for, for, for us because we've got a lot, like, you know, there's a lot of stuff on here, and it sounds like a lot of you have stuff that you could also add, which mm -hmm. would be great, you know, in your own time. Um, although we do want to share the list with people too, actually. Yeah. Um, but thinking about different ways to break it down is useful. Because it is, I mean, it's good to have the world and access and that kind of resolves that possibility of issues for researchers in some ways. One is that it is in the global south, it's located in the global south, you will end up publishing in English mm -hmm. in the global north because yes. that's the academic currency. Second so, is, yes, probably the producer of things in this later will be not referring to the global north or based on and not representing our performance of the English language. Yeah. But there are there are scholars from other countries speaking, but it's just the publications are in English because right. we can't speak the and it, that but to be, to be fair in science in Portuguese. Yeah, could you that language they can they can read the the mm. records. I suppose that's Polish different. Mm -hmm. And like many times when we talk about verbal not I see it it's it really there's also massive in the apartments in China. Which oh, yes. Know very little. And yes. They, they amount to a, a significant portion of what happens on the internet as a well. Yeah, I've and, seen and, some studies of those, but they've been written by lawyers and they're more interested in legal conflicts. But nonetheless, they are. There's they quite do, a bit they are studied. Also, yeah, so I would yeah. 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 also yeah. Russia. I do study a lot of these things in order to understand how to promote the freedom of expression. you do get quite a few, and there are activist groups so the people who might be interested in what we're doing might be fine. for example very different yeah well this is the question that we had